and let's worship. Let's give our Father glory. Great old hymn says, glory to his name. Here we go. Thank you. Well, it's good to be able to gather with you this morning for our time of worship together. Thank you for coming, making the effort to get up, get yourself ready, and to be here with us in this place on this Sunday morning. But while we're gathered here, we also acknowledge that there are those who are connecting with us in the non-traditional ways. We've got a group of people who will be either on Facebook or YouTube, and they'll be watching the service as it's being streamed. And for all of you out there who are worshiping with us in that fashion, we welcome you and are grateful that we have that technology that allows that. There's also that group that are out there either driving around or sitting in their home who are listening, listening on KLEG 97.7 FM. We welcome you to worship with us this morning. You can't see 
see anything, but you can hear everything. And I hope that you will sing along with us and worship with us as you are out and about and, and uh, doing whatever it is that you're doing on this Sunday morning. But thank you for being here in this place. We look forward to what God is going to be doing as we worship together. The, the bulletin has a number of announcements, and I do trust that you are able to read those, and I just challenge you to do that today. Things happening this week, through the weekend, and next week, you read those so that you don't miss something good that you need to be a part of. Uh, we, we look forward to the opportunities that are before us. Let's continue together in worship this morning. In the Word, let's stand together. And I want you to say this passage with me. It's brief, but boy, is it a power-packed word from the Lord. Let's say this together. John 14, 15. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. John 14, 15. Now take a moment, find somebody you've not yet greeted and tell them you're glad to be in worship with them this morning.
Amen. Isn't it good to know we've been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb? We're going to worship. We're going to come before the throne. Man's going to lead us, but we're all going to sing together. I just want to speak the name of Jesus over every heart and every mind. Because I know there is peace within your presence. I speak Jesus. I just want to speak the name of Jesus till every dark addiction starts to break. Declaring there is hope and there is freedom. I speak Jesus.
may be seated. Will you join us this morning as we come around this altar? We bow in his presence, our Savior, our Redeemer, our King. Father, you know that there's that question that we wrestle with along the way and might have even asked last night or this morning, what difference does it make? What difference does it make if I don't go to church? What difference does it make if I don't participate when I'm there? What difference? We watch our kids go away to school Sometimes they get around other people in a fraternity or sorority and they come home and they're, they're talking weird and they're acting weird. And we wonder where they got that from. They've been around some people. They've been influenced by some people. Think about that time a nephew spent time with the bricklayer on their house as it was being built and he learned a whole new vocabulary. Blessed his mom and daddy with some new words at the supper time and they wondered where did you get that ah uh, it's those people you've been around what difference does it make when we come to church what difference does it make when we sing the songs and read the book and pray the prayers what difference indeed here's my prayer today father that when we've come and then when we go that somebody out there might detect that they're different because they've been with Jesus. They're different because they've spent time with their Lord. They're different because they are, they're growing up in their faith. What difference does it make? It makes all the difference in the world, Father. What difference does it make? It could be the difference between eternity in a place called heaven or eternity in a place called hell. It could be the difference between life and dying a little bit more every day. So I pray today that you will make a difference in us as we give ourselves to you in worship. In Christ's name, we praise you. Amen.
Well, last Sunday morning, I wrapped up a series that I've been preaching about encounters between Christ and individuals. And I told you I'd be starting a new preaching series this week. And I am. For the next few weeks, we're going to think together and look together at what the Bible has to say about signs of a healthy church. What does a healthy church look like? In early church this morning, Mary Alice Smith was sitting right down here, and and Mary Alice is a very astute observer, uh, very keen uh, observational skills, and she's apt to walk up to you at any given time and say something to the effect, your color's not good. Now, when Mary Alice Smith tells you your color's not good, it doesn't mean you did a bad job with your makeup. It doesn't mean that the light is not good. It means you look sick. And if she tells you your color's not good, you probably need to make an appointment with your doctor because something may be off. If she makes you stick out your tongue and she looks at your tongue and she says, whew, that doesn't look good either, then you really need to quickly get in touch with your doctor because you look sick. Well, if a church isn't healthy, then a church is what? It's sick. And so if if we want to, to keep from becoming or to come out of being a sick church, and we want to be identified as a healthy church, then we need to know what the Bible has to say. Now, you probably have your ideas. If, if somebody asks you today at lunchtime, hey, where do you go to church? Well, I, go to, I went to First Baptist Church today, or I'm a member of First Baptist Church. And they ask, is your church healthy? How would you answer that? Okay, I get a few yeses murmured through the crowd. But then if they pressed you and said, how do you know? What does that look like? then what would be the indicator? What would be the evidence that you could find that the church is healthy? Well, we've got our our traditional indicators. Oh man, we had a great crowd in worship this morning. I mean, we had had a few bare wood spots. Good night, we got a big one right here. Where did they go? Anyway, we we had a decent crowd and and the singing was good and, and the offering was healthy and we even had somebody join up. Oh, 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 then your church is healthy. Really? Is that, is that the indicator? I found an article that prompted my thinking in this direction and I, I with hesitation read it because my fear was I was going to read the article and this Yahoo was going to tell me that our church was sick and that the main problem was the preacher. And I didn't want to get to that conclusion too quickly, so I read with some trepidation. And as I read, I realized, yeah, 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 I agree. I agree, I agree. And we're not, we're not sick, but we're not as healthy as we could be. We're not about to die, but we're not as vibrant as we ought to be. My hope is that over the next eight or nine weeks, as we make our way through these passages of Scripture, that that God will teach all of us. uh, Because when it comes to the church, uh, and and if somebody were to ask you, well, what's your church? What is the church? Most of you would give an answer. Because when you got up this morning and you, you took a vote and decided, we're going to go to church. Somebody at lunch will say, where have you been? You will say, I've been to church. What does that mean? It means that you drove your car to 2201 Texas Highway 49. You parked in the parking lot. You came in the building. You came to church and you did church. But the fact is that this building, as nice as it is at 2201 Texas Highway 49, this building is not the church. You, you're the church. And so when we start talking about the health of the church, We're talking about you. So stick out your tongue and say, ah. The health of the body is directly connected to you and me and and who we are in Christ and what he's doing in us. So that's that's where we're headed for for nine weeks. And uh, this is not a topical series where I'm going to pull some indicators and try to find a verse to connect with it. Each week we're going to look at a particular passage of Scripture and just let the Lord... I pray speak to us through the power of his Holy Spirit out of that particular text. So this morning, as we begin, I want us to go to Romans chapter 10, and I'm going to begin reading in just a moment in verse 12, and I'll read down through verse 15 as we look at this first indicator. A healthy church 
is a gospel-sharing church. A healthy church is a gospel-sharing church. Listen to what Paul said as he wrote this letter to the church at Rome, and, and there was a particular issue that he was addressing in this part of that letter, and I think it's going to become abundantly clear what that issue was. In verse 12, he wrote, For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek, because some thought there was. They thought there was Jew and Greek. And Jews had a, had a superior place. They had a superior blessing, a superior privilege because of God's choosing of Abraham. And everybody else, the Gentiles, the Greeks, were in on a lower level. Paul addressed that, much to their chagrin. There's no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord is Lord of all, abounding in riches for all who call him. For whoever will call on the name of the Lord, will be saved. Then a series of questions. How then shall they call on him in whom they've not believed? And how will they believe in him whom they have not heard? And how will they hear without a preacher? And how will they preach unless they are sent? Just as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news of good things. A healthy church is a gospel sharing church. As we look at this passage of scripture, understand that Paul is addressing a, a division, a distinction that's being made by some between Jewish folk and non-Jewish folk. And there was this conviction that, that the Jews had a, an extra special privilege in God because of God's choosing of Abraham and them being the chosen people of God. And as a result, they looked down their nose at non-Jews, at, at those who had not subscribed to the covenant as they felt like they ought to. And so Paul, Paul makes this, this clear. When it, when it comes to the gospel, to the good news of salvation by grace through faith in Jesus Christ, there is no distinction between we can fill in our own blanks. There's no distinction between white folk and black folk. There's no distinction between black folk and brown folk. There's no distinction between a Latin culture and a North American American culture. There's no distinction between Baptist and Methodist. There's no distinction we can just fill in the blank. We could keep going. When we divide ourselves according to party lines and ethnic lines and language lines, and we think that one has a better insight into an easier route to God than others do, there's no distinction, he said. And then he makes this statement, for whoever will call on the name of the Lord, will be saved. Whoever? Whoever? That's not a new development. When God called out Israel and made that covenant with Abraham in the Old Testament, it wasn't that he was creating an exclusive club where some were in and most were out. And the innies could look out the window and go, nanny, nanny, boo, boo, we're in and you're out. It wasn't that he was creating this, this privileged class that could look down their nose condescendingly at everybody else. In fact, when you read the covenant that God made with Abraham, God said to Abraham, I, I do wanna, I want you to follow me. I, I want to bless you and make of your seed, your family, a great nation. And through your family, through your seed, all the nations, no exclusions, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. So God was calling them out to become a missionary nation. Their identity would be, yeah, you've been chosen by God, but for a particular purpose. Now go and be that people. And in fact, in Isaiah chapter 28, verse 16, Paul quotes that earlier in this, in this letter. Isaiah wrote, therefore, thus says the Lord God, behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, a tested stone, a costly cornerstone for the foundation, firmly placed. He who believes in that cornerstone, he who believes in that tested stone will not be disturbed, will not be uprooted, will not be removed. So early on in, in Isaiah's writings, there was this idea that faith in God was going to be the sustaining power in life, not a, a national identity, not a, an ethnic identity, but one's willingness to trust God and to follow after him. Israel was to have been a missionary people. The world through them would hear about a loving and holy God. So here, Paul made it clear, abundantly clear, when he used that phrase, and he uses the same kind of idea over and over, whoever will call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. 
He made clear the fact that the good news of the gospel is available to all, no exclusions. God's expression of love, hear me clearly, do not go away and misquote me. God's expression of love through Jesus Christ is a universal expression of love. I don't believe there's anybody who could say that God didn't love me. God doesn't love me. I'm outside the parameters of God's love. I don't believe there's anybody outside the parameters of God's love. And looking last Sunday morning at Judas Iscariot's experience, I think proved that very fact. God's love reaches as far as we are. God's love is available to all. In fact, in John 3, 16, John carefully preserved the words of our Lord. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that, here we are again, whoever. Whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. So we acknowledge that's how we got here. We are here not because we were all that special. We're here not because we, we achieved the ecclesiastical expectations. We're here not because we signed the, the, the uh, covenantal contract with the church family. We're here because we have been saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. Now, here's, here's the expectation. Okay, something has happened in your life. Something has happened in my life. We have been changed and we are being changed. We know Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. We know that he, he rescued us, that he saved us and has given us eternal life. Now, now, tell somebody. Now, share with somebody this good news. In Acts chapter 1, verse 8, again, the words of our Lord. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be my witnesses. Witnesses. That, that same word that we get our English word martyr from, somebody who dies for the cause. But the idea is we ought to be people who are living for the cause. And, and every chance we get, we ought, to be, uh, we ought to be willing, we ought to be available to share our slice of that story. To be a witness is to share a verbal and a lifestyle witness, to point people to faith in Jesus Christ. We ought to be able to share a verbal witness. And some of you just puckered up and quit listening. But the client, I can't do that. I'm, that makes me uncomfortable. I, I can't talk about religion. Oh, come on. This morning as you came in, you had a little time. You've talked about everything under the sun. Some of you, you talked about your team that won last night. And you, you Texas people are beginning to be a little obnoxious. Okay, I'm just telling you. I'm telling you, so you need to be a little more grace-filled than you have been. But we talked about our team either celebrating their glorious victory or, or licking our wounds. But we'll, we'll talk about that. And, and we'll talk about the weather. You know, talk about those people over to the east. Just to the east of us. You realize for the last two days, those people just to the east of us have gotten really good rain. And we've gotten diddly squat. So we talk about the weather. If we don't have anything else to talk about, we'll talk about the weather. We talk about our kids. We'll talk about our families. We'll talk about our health. Some of you have caught up with your neighbor's latest health escapade, escapades. You've seen, you've seen even some of the scars that they could get to without unzipping their britches. You, you know their history. You say, I can't. I can't share my witness. No, that's not the right expression. You don't want to share your witness. Because when you'll talk about your hemorrhoids, you ought to be able to talk about Jesus. <laughs> when you will ad nauseum talk about your latest fishing expedition or your team's exploits last night, you ought to be able to talk about the best thing in the world that ever happened to you, a relationship with Jesus Christ. And so we're called to be witnesses. How, how do I do that? What's a, what's a witness? Well, a witness is somebody who was there, who, who saw it, who experienced it. And so you just talk about what you saw and what you've experienced. Oh, it's okay to throw in a Bible verse or two along the way. That's a wonderful thing. But some of the people you're going to talk to don't know the Bible and don't care about the Bible. So sometimes starting out, you don't just load them up with a bunch of scripture passages and say, you got to turn or burn, get right or get left. Come on, be a witness. Tell somebody, you know what? My life before I met Christ was, and one day I met Jesus. And I want you to know my life has been different since that day. There is an unmistakable and universal 
gospel promise. God's love is, is universal, but God's salvation is not. It doesn't just happen. It isn't an automatic. Oh, some would suggest that the fix is in on salvation, that those who are going to be saved are going to be saved no matter what we do, and those who are going to be lost are going to be lost no matter what we do. And, and that's a, a popular idea that's circulating around in some theological and church circles today. You'll hear that. It, it's done. It's fixed. We can use the idea of predestination or foreordaining or God having already chosen and we really don't have any choice. And uh, yeah. what do we believe about that? I get hit up on that occasionally. Glad to answer. What do we believe about that? Well, I'm not sure what you believe, but I'll tell you what I believe. And I'm going to use the we collectively. We believe. We believe. That yes, God knows. Perfectly. Perfect knowledge. God knows. From beginning to end, God knows. But we also believe that God has given every one of us in this room and every one of us who call ourselves a part of the human race a free will. And God expects us to use that free will to respond in faith to him. The fix is not in. You are not a pre-programmed rob robot. You are an individual that God gave a brain to and a will to choose. And he offers to us, he shares with us through whatever medium he chooses. And that's what we're talking about. We want to be that medium, that witness. And as the gospel is shared, we pray that God's Holy Spirit will convict and individuals will be brought to faith in Jesus Christ. If, if the fix was in, then this message is absolutely worthless. And this church, in my opinion, is absolutely worthless. We ought to close the doors and turn off the lights and go home and find something else to do. Because if God's already done what God's going to do and nothing we do makes a difference, then why in the world are we here? But let me tell you why we're here. Because God told us to do this. He, he instructed us, he commanded us to be witnesses, to share what he's already done in our life so that we can be a part of that process of God drawing others to himself. Well, that takes us to point number two. So there's a plan. It's an unalterable gospel plan. It's, it's the how part of the plan this morning. He asked, how will they believe in him whom they've not heard? And how will they hear without a, a preacher? And you're saying, ah, that's your part. Okay. That word interpreted preacher is a word that could also be interpreted herald. Somebody who stands on the corner, you know, you've seen the English deal. Hear ye, hear ye. Well, you're not going to do that. You'll get carted off if you do that. But it's somebody who is in the public eye, in the public square, and in the course of conversation is able to say, hey, let me tell you. Let me tell you something. Let me share something with you. How, how can they hear? How will they ever know without somebody to be that, that preacher, that, that herald that is out there? And how will they herald? How will they preach unless they are sent? How? See, the church, the yous and me's that comprise the body of Christ were called out. God invited us. The only way we got here was by God inviting us, God calling us to salvation. We respond in faith to Jesus Christ, and he saves us. Nobody else, nothing else. We are saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. And so we come to faith in Jesus Christ, and we can say, Whew, glad I took care of that, past tense. I'm glad I am saved, past tense. But if you are saved, if you've been called out by God, by grace through faith in Jesus Christ, then you have been called out for and set apart for a particular purpose. In Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 through 20, we call it the Great Commission. But it was Jesus' final marching orders for his disciples as he was getting ready to ascend back into heaven to be with the Father. And they were about to be scattered and begin their ministry. And he said, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Well, the Dying on a cross, being buried and rising again will get you there. All authority has been given to me on heaven, in heaven and on earth. Go. Go. Somebody has suggested, and I like the idea, that, that a clearer interpretation, a more helpful to interp interpretation for you and me, would be to understand that as, as you are going. Because you're going to go. Some of you can't wait to go right now. 
I mean, you're, you're counting. We got 14 minutes before the appointed hour. 11.45, that's when the preacher should be through and we can be out of here. And so at, at 11.45, we're going to have an invitation and, and then we're going to have the deacon of the week come and lead us in a closing prayer. And when that amen is said, it's like the bucking chute at the rodeo being opened up. The doors will be thrown open and out you will go. Nobody's going to hang around. If somebody was still in their pew at 11.48, and at 11.53, when Rick came through and turned out the lights, you know what we'd do? We'd call the paramedics because you're sick. They passed out or they've gone on. Because typically when the amen is said, I'm out of here, off to the restaurant, off to the house, off to that excursion for the afternoon, off to the whatever, but you're going, you're going to be going. Tonight, some of you will be going. Tomorrow, you'll be going. As you were going, well, while we we're going, what are we supposed to be doing while you're going? Make disciples. Of who? Well, of all the nations. Oh, not just our kind, no. Not just our people, no. Make disciples of all the nations. Use every means necessary. Use every means available. Do everything you can to be a witness to all the nations of the world and watch God work and draw people in faith to himself. And then baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Because you see, when they get saved, they're not just an isolated entity out there. When we get saved, we are saved into the body of Christ. That's God's design. That's the DNA of salvation. And, and so baptism is not the completion of salvation. Baptism is the because you have been saved testimony of I want to stand with Christ and I want to stand with this body of believers, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. And lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. The plan, who it's clear while you're going, you're called. I'm called. Yeah. You would say, I would hope, I, I think our preacher is called to be our pastor. We called him to be our pastor. I, I think he's called to preach. Well, I am, but you're also called. This isn't your calling. This platform would get mighty crowded if you were all called to be up here with me. And you don't want that, and neither do I. I like doing it myself. This is my calling, but you have a calling. Bob's got a calling. There's no question about that. Antoine, you got a calling. Seth, you got a calling. I'm going to stop there because those are the only three names I can remember. You say, but I, I don't do anything. I don't have a, a title. I don't have an office in the church. No, thank God. The great bulk of our calling is outside these walls. And when you go to work, you're called. And when you're with your family, you're called. And, and when you use your talents and abilities, you're exercising your calling. And our, our calling is to go and, and to be that witness, ready to make disciples. And making disciples is more than just arranging an ecclesiastical transaction, getting somebody down the aisle, getting somebody to be baptized. Our, our part in making disciples is to share the gospel. That's all we can do. We don't save anybody. I've had some people over the years say to me, hey, Brother Clint, I'm so excited. I saved somebody last night. What? I saved somebody. Last night. What do you mean you saved somebody? Well, I shared the gospel. I, I shared a tract with them. I led them to pray the sinner's prayer. And when we finished, we just hugged necks and celebrated. I, I saved somebody last night. I know what they meant. But the reality is, folk, none of us in the room have saved a single soul. If you get choked, I can save you with the Heimlich. If you go down, we can do chest compressions. I'm so glad that they don't have to do that mouth-to-mouth -mouth business anymore. Just we'll, we'll pump your chest. We'll, we will mash on you for as long as is necessary. I can save you in that way, but I can't save your soul. There's only one who can save your soul, Jesus Christ. So we share our testimony. Holy Spirit does the convicting and drawing. You place your faith. They place their faith in Jesus Christ. And then they feel this compulsion to connect with the body, the family. I want to be a part of y'all. There's something in me that's drawing me. Oh, that's where we come back in. Okay, come on, make disciples. It means that you walk with people in life and you encourage them. You, you teach them in a Sunday school class or in a one-on-one -on -one relationship. You teach them about what it means to be a Christ follower. You answer questions like, well, what do I do when my husband, how do I handle it with my wife? Well, what about when my kids go nuts? And well, what about this financial challenge? And what about that ethical issue? And, and we just keep walking with each other. 
connecting with God's word, teaching the word so that we, we get this strong foundation of what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ. And we disciple people. We don't just celebrate them being birthed into the kingdom and then abandon them like some waif out there in a, in a, a fire department. We, we're not doing that. We walk with people and we encourage them and we make disciples. Here's the last part. You see, there's an unavoidable gospel decision in there. How will they call on him in whom they have not believed? Indeed. Earlier in the same passage in verses 9 and 10 of chapter 10, Paul said, if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart a person believes, resulting in righteousness. And with the mouth he confesses, resulting in salvation. We cannot be silent. We've got to share the witness, tell people, this is who Jesus is to me. This is what Jesus has done in my life. And when we faithfully share the good news, God's Holy Spirit is going to do what only God's Holy Spirit is going to do, and that's to convict and draw people to Him. And they're going to get to the point where they're going to, they're going to say, I, I want to be saved. I want to know that I belong to Jesus Christ. What do I do? Wait a minute, wait a minute. I got to get... Let me go get a tract. I, I, wait a minute, I, I got it written down somewhere. I, I know the words that you need to say. We've gotten so hung up on these formulas for salvation, uh, on the right words. There are people out there doubting their salvation because they don't think they said the right words. Well, you know what I think about that? It's a big, th I, I, I'm not so much worried about the words that you say or said. If you are convicted of your need of a savior, if you sense that lostness that you can't fix, and you come to Christ and you say, I can't do it. I cannot fix this. I've tried. I've tried to be good enough. I've tried to, to help enough people. I've tried to, to, to think my way into, into being right. Everything I've done has come up short and it makes me feel more lost than more saved. I cannot do this. But somewhere along the way, I heard about Jesus, that he loved me so much that he went to Calvary's cross and died for my sin. Blows my mind. I don't understand it, but that's what I've been told and that's what I've read in the Bible. He loved me so much, he died on the cross for my sin. They tell me they buried him, and three days later he rose again, victorious over death, hell, and the grave, and he's in heaven now. I don't get it, I don't understand it, but I'm telling you, that's a pretty, pretty spectacular deal if he accomplished that. And I want the life that he provides. So whatever it takes, Lord, forgive my sin. Take away what's between me and you and give me your eternal life. Thank you for saving me. You say, well, Clint, that's a formula. And do they have to say those? No, they don't have to say those exact words. I've heard some seven-year-olds pray some prayers that were pretty cut up and disjointed. As far as I'm concerned, I would tell you from what I saw in them, they were as saved as they're ever going to be. I've heard some adults who had gotten so wound up in their own head, so bent out of shape about getting it right or getting it wrong, and they butchered, they butchered a prayer. And when they got finished, there, there was almost a look of defeat until they realized he did it. He saved me. Yeah, he saved you. It's not about your words. It's about his salvation. It's about what he did. Now, I'm going to tell you, I believe that when we come to faith in Jesus Christ, because of the DNA of our salvation, a part of that, that reality in our life is going to draw us to the body of Christ. Yeah, we're going to want to be baptized, not to be saved, but because we have been saved, to say, I want to stand with this body of believers. And, and we ought to have a hunger then, like a baby has a hunger for its mother's milk. A new believer ought to have a hunger for the word of God. And, and we who are already saved and have grown up a little bit ought to be right there with them and say, come on, come on, let's eat, let's eat, big boy, let's eat, big girl, and let's watch you grow up in Christ. Signs of a healthy church. So here's my question for us as we finish up. When was the last time you had a gospel conversation with anybody? Hmm. Two 
too long. Oh, but we're, we're a healthy church, Clint. Oh, we're a good church. I don't know that we're as healthy as we need to be. Because in a healthy church, the members, as they go out, are not afraid to and are pretty excited to talk about Jesus from your perspective. So I want to challenge you. Talk about Jesus. When you feel the urge to talk about politics, stop it. Talk about Jesus. When you've talked about your school for five minutes, stop it. Start talking about Jesus. When you talk about the weather till you can't talk about it anymore, stop it. Talk about Jesus. You say, well, I don't know how to work him into the conversation. Come on. Just pray. Lord, I want to tell people about I want to share you. Give me an opportunity. I promise you he's going to open the door, throw it wide open and say, well, here you go, big boy. Here you go, big girl. Talk about me. And let's see what happens when we talk about Jesus. Heavenly Father, we've been talking about you. We've been praying. We have been seeking your leadership. And that might have affected some lives in this room this morning to the point that they're ready to say, yeah, I, I, I need Jesus. I want to be saved. I want to know without any question that when I die, I'm going to go to heaven. And as long as I live, I'm going to live for Jesus Christ. I pray for believers, good people doing good things who have stopped doing the best thing, gotten busy, gotten so good that they don't have time for the best. Challenge us, convict us even today. In Christ's name we pray, amen. All right, we're going to sing together a hymn of invitation. It's our opportunity to respond outwardly or maybe quietly standing right there in the pew. Staff, we're here at the front. You come while we sing together, Room at the Cross. Thank you for coming this morning and staying tuned in as we've made our way through the worship service. I want to encourage you to pray for Gene Chapman's family. Many of you know Gene, been a part of our church for a long, long time, uh, been coming in a, in a rolling chair for a while, faithfully coming. And this weekend, the Lord finally said, okay, Gene, it's enough. Your time's up down there. I got a place for you up here. And he called her home. I am grateful for that. She has been relieved and released, but pray for her family. Uh, we'll have a memorial service two weeks from yesterday here at the church. Uh, so just remember the family. We'll remind you of that as we get closer. Marshall Hosey, would you come and lead us in our closing prayer as we're dismissed from our time of worship this morning? Lord, we do thank you for this uh, day that we can come to worship you in your house. We do thank you, Lord, for the rain that you have sent. You know, you send it when we need it. Uh, Lord, I do ask that uh, as, a, as a healthy church, that we, as we go, Lord, we will let people know who we belong to and whose we are. Uh, let us uh, worship you in that way. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.